Hi, I am State Senator Katherine Clark, and welcome to Senate Perspectives. I am very pleased today to have Jeff Clements on the show with me. Jeff is an attorney, and we are going to be talking today specifically about the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United and the effect that that case has had not only on money and politics, but on many, many aspects of American life and how we interact with corporations. Jeff is the president and co-founder of Free Speech for People, which is a national nonpartisan campaign to challenge the creation of constitutional rights for corporations. He is a former assistant attorney general and chief of the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau at the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. He has practiced law in Massachusetts and in Maine and is the author of Corporations Are Not People. Jeff and I, also in full disclosure, went to law school together and I was very delighted to also be at the Attorney General's office when you were there. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you, Catherine. It's uh, great to be here. Great to see you again. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. So we just finished the most expensive political cycle in history in 2012, about $6 billion in spending. Where do you see we are? Um, and let, you know, how do you see the impact of this case on the, the past election cycle? Well, the impact on, uh, of Citizens United, the Supreme Court case in 2010, that struck down the McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign uh, Reform Act, uh, had a devastating effect on the election and on the country. And um, uh, the reason is, is partly the amount of money. So what McCain-Feingold had done Senator McCain, yeah. a Republican, Senator Feingold, a Democrat, the parties came together and said, money is going to destroy our democracy unless we get a handle on it, and banned corporate and labor union independent expenditures. Now, that goes back. It's an American, basically a, a fundamental part of American representative government. If we want self-government, we can't have the, uh, you know, powerful aggregations of wealth dominate our politics. That's, I think, self-government 101. Yeah. So corporate spending in elections has been banned since the Theodore Roosevelt administration, 1907. In 1948, the Taft-Hartley Act extended that to, corporate, uh, to unions, which were at the time, not so much anymore, but at the time were very powerful and deploying cash in, in large quantities like corporations had done um, to some extent. So this goes way back, and McCain-Feingold tried to close a loophole, the, the, the so-called independent expenditures problem of, of corporations and unions running money into elections to basically determine the outcome and who's going to represent us. That was, those loopholes were closed in McCain-Feingold. Now the Supreme Court threw that all away, essentially overturned a century of law said, we the people can't restrict corporate money in elections, we can't restrict union money. And as a result, as people have said, the floodgates opened, yeah. and that's what we saw in 2012. $7 billion in spending in, on the federal elections, and, and, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how much was spent because we don't have adequate disclosure laws. Right. Some are saying as much as $10 billion. And wow. that's a big problem. If that were the only problem, but it's not just the amount of money, it's where it comes from. So if we were all pitching in, you know, 50 bucks each, 300 yeah. million people, it adds up, you know, that would be at least all Americans have a, a say. Uh, but that's not what happens, not at all. Something like 0.5% of the American people actually account for 80% of the political money. Wow. And another statistic from that's the- That's a startling it's, it's statistic. Amazing. And it gets, it gets worse, 32 people gave money to the super PACs that flooded into our election last time. 32 people gave as much as all of the small donors combined to both President Obama and Governor Romney's campaigns. Wow. So all of them combined. One last statistic, <laughs> 200 people made up 75% of the, of the super PAC spending that we saw so much of. All wow. those attack ads everybody saw, 200 people funded 75 percent of that. So in one of them, Sheldon Adelson, 92 million dollars yep. alone. Casino empire that he has globally, 92 million dollars to try to say who's going to represent us, who isn't. So the Citizens United decision was reckless. It's dangerous for the country. 
and we need to overturn it. How big a precedent? How uh, did Citizens United break from precedents Absolutely. Ar around the First Amendment? And maybe if you could give us a little background on sure. that. Sort of what was the standard before Citizens United for looking at the First Amendment and the right to speak and corporations? Sure. So it, it, the, the Citizens United decision, it was five to four, absolutely was a radical departure from traditional First Amendment jurisprudence, the kind of freedom of speech, uh, free press um, laws we've always had in our Constitution under the First Amendment. Citizens United just turned it upside down. And you don't have to take my word for it, Catherine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, we can read the dissent right. of, of Justice John Paul Stevens, hardly a, a radical. He right. was a, appointed to the Supreme Court by Gerald Ford, president. He was 90 years old at the time, a lifelong Republican, a corporate and antitrust lawyer before he went on the court in the yeah. 1970s. His dissent said that what the court did in Citizens United was a radical departure, quote unquote, radical departure from First Amendment jurisprudence. And you can, uh, don't even have to take his word for it, we can look at actually what cases Citizens United decided no longer counted. So the Supreme Court already had decided this very question. The McCain-Feingold law that I talked about, right. that, qu that was challenged in 2003 in a case called McConnell. The Supreme Court said it's perfectly constitutional. The American people, we have a right to keep corporate and union money out of our elections if we decide to do that. That's what McCain-Feingold did. And in 2003, the Supreme Court said it was perfectly constitutional, a case called McConnell. So how did it happen that six years later, the yeah. First Amendment suddenly meant something else? Well, here's how it happened. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, a Republican from Arizona, right. retired. Moderate. She, a moderate. <laughs> she had written the McConnell decision in, in, that, in large part and pieces of it that were, were significant for this point. She had written it. Chief Justice Rehnquist died, unfortunately, and Chief Justice Rehnquist had been in, when this idea of corporate speech first started taking hold among a certain uh, you know, segment of the court, he had been dissenting over and over again, saying in a Republican self-government, you can't have aggregations of corporate wealth have that kind of unlimited power. Well, he passed away. And so what happened was we got Chief Justice John Roberts and we got Justice Samuel Alito with a, an agenda to change what had been settled First Amendment law. F Citizens United said McConnell doesn't count. They threw it out, overturned it, decided the same yeah. question exactly the opposite way. They overturned a case from 1990 that said the states have a right to keep corporate money out of elections. That case wow. was called Austin. They threw that out. They <laughs> threw out a century of law and s essentially made up new law that we are now living with today in what we saw in the last election, and it's going to get worse. And what was Citizens United's claim? Well, Citizens United is a, the reason it's called that. It sounds yeah. like a, a good thing, right? <laughs> right Citizens it does. should be united. So, um, and it's a it's a it's a conservative group in in Virginia. It's a nonprofit corporation, and they wanted to run an attack ad against Hillary Clinton, who was running for president at the time. Now, all of that should be fine. That is, you know, traditionally we think of. Nothing wrong with that. A, a, a organization wants to criticize, people want to criticize a powerful senator running for president. Let's hope we can all continue we to do that. We can all do that, right. We need to do that um, as responsible citizens. But what happened was, um, so they were, they were challenging the McCain-Feingold Act because they were saying we want to raise corporate money to run these attack ads. Now that's where everything changed. Right. If they simply wanted to pool their money as citizens to say, you know, let's attack let's Hillary put Clinton. This ad on. Perfectly fine to do. But what they were te they were testing, uh, trying to get this struck down, and they had this case where they could argue that by not being able to get corporate money, by not being able to um, run these ads essentially in a way that violated the McCain-Feingold mm -hmm. Act, they were being restricted in speech. And now, even if that case had come out differently, there already had been exceptions for nonprofit groups. Uh, it would have been fine. It would have been an obscure campaign finance case right. that you could agree with or disagree, but it would not have had the ramifications it had. The reason why the, that Citizens United became so momentous is because the five justices who decided it chose to make it momentous. And they said, you know, it doesn't matter about a nonprofit group. It doesn't matter if it's Citizens United. 
wanting to uh, run corporate funded ads against Hillary Clinton. This applies to every corporation. It applies to Exxon. It applies to Goldman Sachs. It applies to the largest global corporation with subsidiaries all over the world. That's why money's pouring in. Foreign money comes in, and which should be illegal. It is illegal for a foreign national to make a direct contribution right. to right. American That's politicians. And that federal and state law. Ex exactly. <laughs> but, but if you have a global corporation, if Chevron, as Chevron did, put $2.5 million into a super PAC to run attack ads to prevent any different, to, to prevent any um, way to address the climate catastrophe we're having, to prevent um, laws that will help us move towards a much more renewable energy future that America needs. T Chevron doesn't have an interest in that. They put $2.5 million into the election. Wh where did Se Chevron's dollars come from? They're global. They come from all right. over the world. So it, what, what Citizens United did was it no longer matters that it was about a nonprofit organization criticizing Hillary Clinton. So when people hear that, well, you know, what's wrong with Citizens United? It sounds like it, it came out the right way. No, if it had just been that, it would not be an issue. The problem was the court chose to essentially overturn all of the rules we had carefully set up to try to keep corporate and, and big union and money big out union. of our elections so we the people could actually engage in debate with ourselves and have conversation and choose who's going to represent us. Yeah. So we heard a lot after the election, well, you know, okay, there's a lot of big money in this, but both sides engaged in it. This was a nonpartisan super PAC. So what really in the end of the day, if everything comes out even, what difference does it make? But I think there is a huge impact beyond campaigns, uh, which I think we've already talked about, sort yeah. of the diminishing voice of the average citizen. Yeah. When you have 200 people donating 75% of the money going into these super PAC organizations. But even if you put that aside, what other impacts does this ha decision have outside of the political realm? Yeah, so it's, a, it's um, when you take a look, sort of step back and look at the impacts of this, uh, we begin to see the kind of a devastating effect that, that the, the people said would be the case. and. You can look at it from different ways. I mean, the biggest sort of overall picture is kind of the question of what does it mean to be a citizen yeah. in, a, in a free republic where we govern ourselves? Well, if, if it, what it means is something like American Idol where, where we watch, you know, where we become, rather than citizens, we're consumers and we watch our billionaires against their billionaires and then we go and pull a lever depending on what we saw, that's not democracy. We're not going to get policy that represents the people. Um, so both sides do do it. That's the problem. That's why nothing happens in Washington that the people actually want to happen, because both sides have lots of uh, money infrastructure, essentially, that, that is a special interest. And you have big aggregations of corporate wealth, essentially, um, paralyzing representative government. So that alone is a huge problem. Right. And you even have it at local government. I mean, I mentioned Chevron. They spent $1.2 million in a city council race in a community of 100,000 people oh, in Richmond, wow. California. Why? Because they have a refinery there that exploded and sent thousands of residents in Richmond to the hospital in August before the election. So they had a problem if the city council was actually concerned about the refinery and answering to the people who'd been hospitalized rather than wow. to Chevron. They spent $1.2 million. That's an impact. But it's even worse because, you know, put aside the corruption and the problem of unlimited money in elections and what it does to all of us and all of our representatives who want to be doing a good job but have to spend right. so much time raising money because of the attack ads and that are going to be coming at them from, from the special interest. Put aside all that. If corporations have speech rights, like the Citizens United case says they do, basically we are seeing the dismantling of the middle class uh, America that was so carefully built over two centuries. And I can run through a series of things that show that. F the most recent, the, um, you, uh, the right to be informed as an employee that you have a right to organize, to join a union to try to boost your wages and your wages of your fellow workers. 
forever, we've assumed, well, workers surely can be informed of that right. No, that was recently held to be a violation of corporate speech. This time, the right not to speak. So with that's gone. We have uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms in our food. Great, great concern to many, many Americans, both sides, yeah. all sides of the political it's spectrum. A lot of, lo it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue, both and we're the only democracy in the world whose people are not allowed, according to the to, according to the court, wow. to require labeling because that has been held to violate corporate right not to speak, not to disclose that there's GMOs in the food. So we have all based on Citizens United. Yeah, and some of this happened even doctor. before Citizens yeah. United. We started wow. to see the striking down of environmental laws, um, worker safety laws, financial regulation laws. Even before Citizens United, Verizon, when it was caught working with the federal government to monitor customer phone calls. This was during the Bush administration. You may recall that there was yeah. a wiretapping of of Americans phone calls and monitoring of American phone calls with with Verizon and AT&T and other big corporations basically surreptitiously conducting what is was clearly at the time illegal surveillance of, of Americans and uh, when challenged when Verizon said they have a right of corporate free speech to do that even though it was illegal they were claiming a First Amendment right to do that and they got away with it. Congress passed a law preventing any accountability uh, against the, the telephone uh, corporations for doing illegal surveillance. Uh, wow. We see it, unfortunately, with the gun industry. The gun industry essentially locking down uh, any kind of reform, even common sense reform for, for firearm safety, basic firearm safety. So on almost every issue now, we're seeing this idea of a corporate trump card, a corporate veto that Citizens United used on our campaign finance laws. It's been used on all our laws. And, and if, if it stands, the idea of a government of, for, and by the people uh, is truly in question, I think. Yeah. And we were talking um, before the show started about tobacco warnings. Right. Um, even that. Yes. Right? And in 2009, Congress said, FDA, you haven't done your job. We have these old uh, tobacco cigarette warning labels from, from 1960s. <laughs> yeah. and everybody has maybe seen them, but you don't really see them anymore. They're so small. Yeah. And, uh, and if you, uh, almost every democracy in the world has a much more realistic warning about the dangers of cigarettes, especially to young people. And they're called graphic warning labels. They're standard in, in almost every country in wow. the world. Congress said FDA update the tobacco warning labels, graphic warnings, come up with them. FDA, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, which had responsibility for this, did do it, its job. It came up with graphic warnings. Uh, and the tobacco corporations uh, brought a case saying it violated their right of free speech, and the court agreed, struck down. Uh, so on almost every kind of issue that people care about, even if we can get through the massive amount of corporate lobbying and get a law passed, it gets subject to this, uh, really what it's Justice Stevens called the radical implementation of a corporate veto under our Constitution, and that, that needs to change. What, what do you see as the public reaction to this? I think a lot of people have a vague understanding of, of what Citizens United did, but don't really think about all those other implications into so many different areas of their lives and privacy. And uh, what is public opinion? What, what are polls showing? What, where, where are we as a country and a state looking at this issue? Yeah, and that, you know, I got to say, Catherine, that's the really good news is the, the Ameri American people, Americans are resilient. We get it. Uh, people are not fooled. Uh, I think people know what Citizens United meant. They know that corporations should not have the same rights as we human beings under the Constitution. We know that unlimited spending um, pushes and silences most Americans, at, at, and, and we know mm -hmm. that it has to change. And I say that because not only have I been all over the country to, to talk to people and see this, but the polling shows it over and over again. The earliest polls after Citizens United asked two essential questions. One is, if you know about Citizens United, what do you think? And then just a sort of neutral reading of what Citizens United did, um, if they hadn't heard of it, what do they yeah. think? 79% of the American people said that is wrong, that will destroy our country, 
and they thought a constitutional amendment should be used to overturn the case. That included 68 percent of Republicans, um, well into the high 70s and 80s for independents and Democrats. But basically, an American consensus that yeah. Citizens United is wrong and we have to overturn it. That has held up in every poll since. A poll of small business people, two-thirds say Citizens United is wrong, has to be overturned. Two-thirds of these business people, most, many of whom are Republicans, said that it, will, it favors global corporations at the expense of Main Street corporations, yeah. of, of Main Street businesses, of most American businesses. And it, you know, it essentially is a way for glo biggest global corporations to tilt the deck yeah. in favor of them. And to even amplify their already exactly. huge position e exactly. <laughs> in the market. And you know, the best poll, of course, is, as, as you know, is, is the vote, because that's when yeah. people get to say and, and show what they think. So it's not just a pollster asking. And we've seen that, too. So I, I would just say very briefly, in Montana last November, on the ballot was a question about Citizens United, about whether corporations have the same rights as people under our Constitution, and whether we, the people, have a right to regulate spending in elections, and whether Citizens United should be overturned. So Montana is, as, as uh, the uh, you know, pundits like to say, a red state. Fifty-five percent of Montana voted for Governor Romney for president. Well, 75 percent of people in Montana voted in favor of the ballot initiative to overturn Citizens United, and not just to ask, not just to demand, but to instruct Montana wow. representatives to get a constitutional amendment passed to reverse Citizens United and end this uh, twisting of our Constitution to create corporate rights to return us to a democracy of the people. And I know in Massachusetts last year, I got to work with you and uh, your organization and a whole group of other legislators to pass a resolution asking for a constitutional amendment. Are, are you seeing similar, is that, is that happening across the country? Are yes. you seeing lots of other states coming up with either at, at the ballot or um, out of their legislative bodies? Yes, ab absolutely. And that's, that's what gives me the confidence. We yeah. are going to win this. And, and uh, I, I will thank you again, Catherine, for your leadership on this. Well, it was terrific. Yeah. Massachusetts was uh, in the lead, one of the, one of the early states to pass this resolution, and you were a big part of it, along with, with many others. So it was a terrific example for the country. Um, so now 14 states have enacted resolutions Great. calling on Congress to send the 28th Amendment to the states for ratification that will overturn Citizens United. The most recent was Illinois, uh, but three states in the last uh, month and a half have Great. done it. Maine, West Virginia, Illinois just did it last week. This is uh, one of those historic moments in our country's history when the American people are stepping up in states, in cities and towns. 500 cities and towns have passed these resolutions. People are saying, nobody's going to do this for us. We can't count on the lawyers to fix it in the court. The judges yeah. aren't going to do it. Our politicians, as, as hard as they work and as good as they want to try to be, can't do it if the Supreme Court says we're not allowed right. to pass laws that uh, re restrict spending in elections. Um, so it's up to us, as it has been before, to use the amendment process to essentially do much more fundamental reform so that we can renew this great democracy. So that is what your organization, is that really your mission? Is yes, to yeah, so Free Speech for People, and you can read more <laughs> and check it out at freespeechforpeople.org. Uh, but yes, we're helping to lead, uh, along with many others, this constitutional amendment movement. We're going into courts, we have a legal program where we are no longer going to have corporate lawyers get a free pass when they claim about corporate rights. We're going into courts to to fight back and to be there for the people. So it's coming at both, and, yes, both the amendment need, process and the legal. Right. There's yeah. only two ways to overturn the Supreme right. Court. One <laughs> is the Supreme Court does it itself. Yeah. They had a chance and they didn't do it to fix Citizens United. So, yeah. uh, but we're going to keep trying. But the other way is a constitutional amendment. And seven t Supreme Court decisions have been overturned by constitutional amendment in our history. So we want to make Citizens United number eight. That's great. So how, how can people help? How can people get involved? Um, absolutely. This is something everybody needs to get involved yeah. to. So first, freespeechforpeople.org. Check it out. Sign up there and stay informed. 
People can work on resolutions in their cities and towns. We need to get Congress on board. M many of the congressional delegation from Massachusetts is supporting the two key amendment principles uh, and, and amendment language, one that overturns the idea that unlimited money is a right, that, that yeah. essentially billionaires have, uh, have a right to, to have a billion more uh, <laughs> speakers, uh, if you will, than somebody who only has a dollar. Uh, we're supposed to come to the ballot box as equals. The amendment will do that. Uh, Congressman Jim McGovern has introduced H.J. Res 20, which is the amendment, and right. many people are behind that. So get um, folks in other states uh, and thank those who here in Massachusetts who are behind it in favor of that. And H.J. Res 21, which is the amendment language that says corporations don't have constitutional rights. They're creations of the state and of the people, and we make the rules for corporations, not the other way around. Um, returning to that basic American principle. Um, and so we need people to get involved to support those amendments, to write letters to the editor, to talk to their neighbors and friends who may not know, A, what happened, or B, if they do know, you know, often there's a sense of, well, we can't do anything about it. Things are just I too think, hard. Yeah, and I think that's a And we have to huge... say, well, no, if we don't do it, nobody else will. Right. We're going to do this. Uh, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, mm -hmm. they had hard struggles, too. And if if they yeah. have the same attitude, like, oh, there's nothing to be done, we would not be where we are and, and made as many advances towards a real democracy as we have. So, you know, now it's our turn. We don't have a choice to just say, well, I guess it was a nice democracy while we had it. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have to, it's our job. That's what government of the people is, and that's what the amendment process can do. So there's a lot of ways to get involved. Check out freespeechforpeople.org or, or shoot me an email and ask me, uh, <laughs> Jay Clements at freespeechforpeople.org. So. Great. And I think that you, you touched on something um, that's very real, that this creates a very vicious cycle because as we see more money coming into politics from the very, very wealthy, um, it, it further creates cynicism, um, lack of transparency in our elections and government um, that creates a divide. And I really think that it is hard for people to think about reclaiming their government and reclaiming their rightful position as a voter and that that should be the ultimate authority on how we structure and run a government. So I think it's very hopeful to know that this is supported. This is not a partisan issue. This is about where we go as a country and that people do have a voice. You can really do something. It's been done seven times before and this isn't, I think people get the feeling that this is something we did historically, but now it's too hard. All right, All right. and I think we, we, need to, we need to let that go, you know, yeah. as, as, uh, um, as Abraham Lincoln said, you know, we need, we need to let go of our illusions and then we'll save ourselves. And so one of the illusions is the Constitution was written 200 years ago. Uh, and it's, you know, we just don't amend it anymore. That's not true. We've amended yeah. the Constitution in every single decade in the 20th century, except the 40s and the 80s. Uh, so oh, every decade we did an yeah. amendment. Senators get elected because of an amendment. Women have the right to vote because of an amendment. We have equal voting rights because of an amendment. The Supreme Court struck down the idea that we can have an income tax. Well, that was overturned by a constitutional amendment. In the last time we had the kind of gilded age of power that we're con confronted with now was the turn of the last century uh, when the railroad barons and, uh, and others had essentially taken over democracy. Child labor laws were struck down. Worker safety laws were struck yeah. down. And campaign finance laws were struck down. The, the people, in, Americans in that generation, four constitutional amendments in the space of 10 years. So if we don't use this amendment process, then, then it's, it's not a fault of the Constitution, it's a fault of ourselves. I think this is one of those moments where we're called to try to get it done. And you know, even amendments that don't succeed, the Equal Rights Amendment perhaps being the best right. example, was not that long ago fighting for the idea of the Equal Rights Amendment for men and women, even though it didn't win in the end, it fell one state short of ratification, helped change the world. Uh, you know, we are more equal. We are more true to ourselves as Americans of equal people because people fought for the Equal Rights Amendment. It caused a shift in the culture, in our laws to say actually, you know, our sons and daughters will be equal. Right. Men and women will be equal. And we are much closer to that because we had a national conversation 
about what it means to be a free and equal person in America. And that's what is happening now. So well, I think we can do this. Thank you so much for that call to action for coming. I've never had a book before <laughs> on my show. So we want to show the, um, this book. And if you would like to read it, just contact my office. We'll get you a copy. Um, it, is, it is informative and not difficult uh, to, to read. And it's, it's really well done. And uh, thank you so much for your work you're doing and uh, for being on today. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Great to be here.